Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chris Barkin, and I want to welcome you to the virtual William W. Hay Railroad Engineering Seminar today. Uh, before we begin, uh, I just want to remind everybody uh, that as a virtual seminar, uh, the way to ask questions is using the questions tab. Um, you, should, you should be able to find, on the, at least on my screen, it's on the lower right hand side. So you might find that sometime uh, in the next few minutes as you, uh, if you want to ask any questions. The other way to do it is to send your questions via email to hayseminar at illinois.edu. The William W. Hay Railroad Seminar Series is sponsored by the Rail Transportation and Engineering Center here at the University of Illinois. And on behalf of all of us, we thank BNSF, CN, Anson Professional Services, and the Union Pacific Railroad for their ongoing support of our educational activities here. It's greatly appreciated by those of us here on campus, as well as those of uh, you participating uh, via the internet. I'd also like to extend a welcome to the more than 200 people that have registered for this seminar. It's a fantastic turnout, uh, I think quite worthy of the speaker. And um, um, so we're really pleased to have you here today. And those of you who wish to receive PDHs for your participation, uh, please send us an email with your information as described in the email announcement for the seminar. I believe there's also a link on the, in the announcement. So rail safety in the United States has improved dramatically over the last three decades. Uh, anybody who's been around that long, such as myself, can certainly appreciate that from looking at the statistics. But the other thing that's evident in the last um, half a dozen years or so is that that trend is kind of level off. And that's not because of any relaxation of effort on the part of either the uh, industry or government. It's because, it's because the problems have become more challenging to solve. Consequently, we need research. Um, we need research to identify solutions to these problems. And that, of course, is one of the principal goals and objectives of the Federal Railroad Administration's research <laughs> technology program. Um, sorry about that. Let me introduce our speaker. Uh, Miriam Alahar is Director of the Office of Research, Development and Technology at the Federal Road Administration in the U.S. Department of Transportation. Following completion of her undergraduate degree, uh, Dr. Alahar went on to complete her Master's in Experimental Psychology and Statistics at California State University, Northridge, and her PhD in Cognition and Perception at the University of Washington. Following completion of her degree, she taught and conducted research at Cal State Bakersfield and then took a position as a technical expert in human factors at the U.S. Air Force Edwards Flight Test Center. In 2011, she moved to the NTSB where she was a human performance investigator and she then moved to the Pentagon where she was a senior research psychologist for the Chief of Staff of the Army. She joined the FRA in 2015 as their Chief of Engineering Psychology and Human Factors Research, and two years later was promoted to her current position as Director. As should be evident, uh, Dr. Alahar has impeccable educational and experimental credentials in human factors and transportation research. And although there remain a number of ways we can further improve rail railway safety, I believe that the uh, most important remaining challenges of the 21st century are developing solutions to the myriad of human factors related problems. Consequently, highly apropos that Dr. Alahar leads the FRA research program today. Please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Alahar pres presenting the William W. Hay Seminar, FRA Research Development and Technology Overview. Dr. Alahar. Well, good afternoon from the East Forest and uh, Dr. Barkin, Chris, thank you very much for that very warm, warm welcome and introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, it's uh, great to uh, be among, you know, academic colleagues today. Um, as you heard already, that uh, you know, my heart and soul is really in academia. I, I was an academic before, and uh, it's uh, one of the places where I feel at home. So um, thank you again. I really appreciate this. I just wish that we could all be in the same room and um, you know, have this conversation and follow-up conversations. Um, and hopefully that will happen soon too. Um, without further ado, uh, I would like to provide a little overview of the program. And then after that, talk about some of the highlights of the program that we have here uh, at FRA, uh, some of the work that we do. And, uh, and beyond that, um, 
you know, I provided some um, information about the research uh, program managers that uh, lead the research that I'm going to be discussing, and, and you can definitely reach out to them uh, with any further um, questions that you might have. So with that, um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Great. Um, I always begin by stating the FRA uh, RDNT's mission, and it is to ensure the safe, efficient, and reliable movement of people and goods by rail through applied research and development of innovative technologies and solutions. We are able to accomplish this goal and mission by stakeholder engagement and partnership with other researchers, with universities, with, with Association of American Railroads, and by prioritizing our projects and conducting research through cost-effective procurement. Next slide, please. Um, I also would like to bring to your attention one of our recent publications. Uh, we have, speaking of strategy, uh, we just, uh, in July of 2020, we published our uh, research development uh, and technology strategic plan for FRA uh, that covers 2020 to 2024. This is our five-year strategic plan aligned with DOT's strategic goals of safety, infrastructure, innovation, and accountability. Um, throughout the work that I present today, you will see um, me repeat these four goals uh, repeatedly. So just wanted to make sure that you know these are the, these are the goals of DOT and we're fully aligned with them. Um, we have four major divisions in our uh, research and development um, program, track division, rolling stock, train control and communication, and human factors. Next slide, please. I would like to go over our structure of R&D and then I move into uh, talking about specific projects. Next slide, please. So um, like I mentioned in um, um, our um, program, um, there are four major divisions and we have the track, rolling stock, train control and communication and human factors. Um, Mr. Sean Woody, who, who is the newest addition to our uh, um, program uh, is the chief of track division. Um, we are very excited to have Sean Woody on, on board. Um, Sean comes from um, over 29 years of uh, leading uh, research for Norfolk Southern, and we are very excited to have him on board. Um, the rolling stock division is led by Mr. Leonard Evans, and uh, Mr. Evans has a significant um, experience in rolling stock um, and equipment, particularly um, when he was with the state of Ohio. He's been with FIR for a number of years and he joined us last year um, to the RDNT program. Train control and communication, Mr. Sam Ibrahim. Uh, he is uh, truly uh, uh, well known in his area. He is an expert in PTC and he leads the program as a chief. And the human factors division, which used to be my former home, uh, Dr. Star Kidda leads that division and uh, she has uh, extensive experience in uh, safety culture and safety culture improvement, as well as um, other areas of human factors. So could we go to the next slide, please? I wanted to talk a little bit about the track division. Of course, the focus is to develop track inspection technologies, um, computer modeling capabilities, and expand the use of autonomous inspection methods. And we do all of that because we want to be able to reduce uh, derailments to, uh, to track defects and um, track problems. In the autonomous inspection technologies, we expand the use of autonomous inspection methods and um, provide more frequent and cost-effective measures and quality assessment of track conditions. For the artificial intelligence-based um, risk analysis, we invest in development of uh, a variety of technologies um, utilizing artificial intelligence to increase safety and reduce human error by improving the speed, accuracy, and consistency of the inspection process. For safety assurance uh, performance measures, um, um, basically railroads are currently testing automated and autonomous technologies to supplement safety inspections. Um, RDNP will develop standards and procedures to verify and
minimum track safety requirements, uh, derailment root causes, uh, defect initiation, and um, crack growth rates. Uh, for, for advanced defect uh, detection measures, we invest in research and development of um, uh, improved methods uh, to locate, monitor, and predict the performance of difficult to detect uh, rail um, uh, track safety issues. Um, and these could include anything from um, rail internal defects, um, um, longitudinal rail forces um, related to the issue and, um, and ballast. Can we go to the next slide, please? In the rolling stock division, we examine the structural integrity of the trains to increase passenger safety and reduce hazardous material releases. Um, and there are core areas of research um, and priorities in rolling stock as well. For the automated inspection technologies, um, we partner with the railroad industry to foster further development of automated wayside and onboard inspection te uh, techniques and technology. Uh, for improved material and component design for rolling stock components, we invest in testing and analysis to identify materials um, which can provide improved performance and durability in the railroad environment. For the um, occupant protection enhancement, we invest in means for improving train occupant protection in the event of a collision um, or derailment uh, by mitigating the potential for loss of occupied um, volume and minimizing um, the secondary impact velocity. And I will be I'm discussing uh, research um, that we uh, have recently completed on that. Uh, in improving the safety of hazardous material transportation, we continue to develop, analyze, and test means for improving the structural integrity of tank cars. And for um, uh, energy and environmental sustainability, uh, we investigate means for ensuring um, the advance, uh, the advances in um, alternative fuels um, such as CNG, LNG, uh, with the railroads um, uh, as they're being introduced uh, because we want to make sure that they are transported in a safe manner. Next slide, please. For train control and communication, um, the focus is uh, to reduce train collisions with other trains and with objects and um, anything that is on highway rail uh, grade crossing. The core area and the main focus of this uh, program that we have uh, under Sam and Limerham is uh, the PTC, um, um, Performance Next Generation. And the PTC performance monitoring and reporting basically continues in the development and deployment of data collection and analysis tools for PTC systems under normal operating conditions to monitor and evaluate the system performance. For the next generation PTC technologies, uh, we focus on enhancing existing PTC technologies and taking advantage of uh, the advances in automation, communication, sensor technologies um, to further improve safety. Uh, the intelligent transportation system is an area where it's uh, multimodal. We work on uh, with, with other modes on this area, and we invest in uh, connected vehicle technologies to ensure um, safe interaction of road vehicles with um, trains, mainly at grade crossings. And we also look at artificial intelligence in, in uh, train and control communication um, to incorporate um, AI and um, uh, in, into the research related to a predictive um, uh, analytic for PTC systems. Next slide, please. For the human factors uh, program, um, we, um, um, this is obviously where my home was, we address um, accident causes um, by human error, uh, which is the most common cause of railroad accidents. Uh, in, uh, in this group, we are um, investigating fatigue and identifying existing gaps in fatigue research using a variety of methods to study fatigue in railroad operations, including survey research, human subject simulation, uh, in, in simulator uh, uh, experiments, we have a simulator at Volpe um, that is designed to um, 
do all sorts of tests. You know, we look at uh, um, human automation interaction, fatigue. Um, it's used by other researchers as well. For the human automation interaction, um, um, we address human error um, um, basically to uh, reduce the human error uh, when human is interacting with uh, the computer, uh, with the monitor, with the system that is providing the information. We investigate the safety aspects that are associated with integrating people and technology. For grade crossing safety, we identify um, um, gaps um, and continue to investigate technologies to improve grade crossing safety and motorist behavior at grade crossing. You've, you've seen this in the controls and communication. Um, in that group, we address the technology. In here, and the human factors, we try to address the human behavior aspects of grade crossing. Trespass and suicide prevention, where we conduct pilot studies with uh, rail carriers that are implementing different strategies to mitigate trespass and suicide. And uh, the Short Line Safety Institute is, uh, you know, we continue this program um, that has been in place for several years now. We continue to provide program monitoring and support for the Institute. Um, the Short Line Safety Institute provides safety culture assessment and training to small railroads, which are largely located in rural areas. Next slide, please. So with that, I would like to move to a few things that, uh, and this is only a very small sample of the work that we are doing uh, in RDNT, but I wanted to highlight a few um, uh, of the work that we're doing. And I try to uh, go outside of track a little bit, and just because I know you are extremely um, well versed in um, uh, research and track, and I wanted to show you some of the other areas that you're working on and, uh, in, you know, increase your interest in the other areas uh, of collaboration that perhaps we could have in the future. Next slide, please. The predictive an analytic platform for ATGMS um, and data. Uh, RDNT established this collaborative research uh, with a passenger railroad that um, operates three AT ATGMS uh, vehicles um, over their network um, daily. Uh, in some cases, it's multiple times daily, um, which is obviously, I don't have to tell you, which is the ideal uh, way to monitor the size and growth rate of track geometry and deviations. The first phase um, successfully developed an uh, innovative way to automatically align track geometry from multiple runs by multiple vehicles, which is then uh, segmented into workable chunks of varying length um, for the trending analysis and uh, peak um, extraction. Um, we are just about done with the second phase of the work, during which the um, automation of the process um, from collection to reporting um, has been completed. Um, we have a couple of months uh, remaining. Um, at this time, it, ha it, it hasn't been fully implemented yet, um, but those are the next steps, followed by monitoring of results and gathering feedback. Uh, gathering feedback um, on, uh, on the issues um, in the uh, maintenance planning portion of it. For the phase three of this research, um, we'll be um, um, basically, phase three will um, look at the field verification of the research results that we have and uh, seeing uh, from the implemented process to determine how the signals related to the actual condition of the track and um, suggest possible uh, remediation strategies based on the data that we have. Next slide. Um, the performance of pressure relief um, valve under fire conditions. This is a test that we actually conducted in Germany um, last year. Uh, tank cars are required to have a pressure relief valve to protect the tank car under derailment um, um, fire conditions. Um, however, the performance of the PRVs under fire conditions hasn't 
uh, previously been uh, evaluated and confirmed. The intent of this project uh, is uh, has been to, uh, to uh, document um, by scale testing uh, under nominal flyer conditions, PRB performance uh, with respect to opening pressure uh, and then reclosing and then um, and then um, basically um, evacuating the tank. The initial test uh, was with water as labeling, and the subsequent test uh, is uh, going to be with flammable lighting. Um, the impact of this, of course, uh, for industry is uh, to have a better understanding of the risks associated with the hazardous material transportation and quantification of PRV performance, um, which will help industry with design and standards of, uh, of the appropriate uh, um, PRDs uh, appropriate for the flammable liquid surfaces. And if we go to the next slide, I can tell you a little bit more about the setup of this project. Uh, uh, preparation, this was the preparation for the uh, test. Um, and the instrumentation of it. Uh, the natural gas burners were installed uh, to simulate a combustible pool wire to engulf the tank. And the PRV valves were evaluated separately at various positions, including vertical 45 degrees and 120 degrees. And um, the PRV survived um, and functioned safely when subjected to moderately high temperatures for 40 to 60 minutes. Um, Francisco Gonzalez is the lead for this project. Uh, Francisco is uh, extremely knowledgeable and uh, um, is leading our um, tank car research program. And with that, if we go to the next slide, this is another project that uh, Francisco um, leads. Um, the FRA's tank car impact test goal is to evaluate the crashworthiness and the structure integrity of different tank car designs when subjected to a standardized repeatable shell impact scenarios and has helped to understand the behavior and puncture resistance of tank cars um, when involved in an accident. If uh, you were to look at the timeline that we have had for uh, the tank car test that we've done so far, uh, we've done 11 tests and uh, the the first, uh, the first nine, zero to nine actually, um, were um, single shell tank cars. They were DOT 105, 111, 112, and 117. And then we tested 110, uh, or test 10 and 11, um, were on DOT 113s. Um, before I go further into the details of the DOT 113 testing, I wanted to uh, give a shout out to the team, uh, Francisco and his team, uh, for being able to carry out this test uh, this year during uh, um, the pandemic. Um, we were um, doing this remotely um, um, and uh, Luis uh, Mall, who was the only FRA legs on the ground at TTC, uh, provided uh, some oversight to it too. Um, and Volpe team um, from Cambridge uh, did the, the, the analysis part of it. And of course, TTCI carried out the uh, actual test for us. Um, a, a truly teamwork to be able to accomplish something during some difficult times and making sure that we continue the work. Um, so um, let's talk about the test itself a little bit. And the approach for the 113, um, DOT 113 has been basically the tank car was uh, to use full scale and laboratory testing with um, companion finite element modeling, which will be provided, and uh, conduct the test at TTC, which we accomplished, uh, to ultimately uh, represent a DOT 113 tank car under LNG service conditions um, subjected to a shell impact. Uh, we conducted two tests so far uh, with water. One was in November 2019, and the other one, as I mentioned, in June 2020. Uh, the first one, uh, the, the, the first one uh, was a typical tank, um, and um, the second one was the slightly thicker tank. Um, and we plan to conduct two more tests uh, with um, um, cryogenic liquid um, as the labeling. And that will be in um, the first part of 2021. Next slide, please. 
And uh, this is the cross section of the test um, and the setup of the test. The DOT 113 design uh, is a tank within a tank um, with um, super insulation and vacuum in between. Um, like a, a thermos bottle, basically. The inner tank is tank is uh, made out of stainless steel, and the outer tank is um, carbon steel. And of course, the reason for this is because uh, cryogenic liquid is very cold and it needs to remain cold uh, so it doesn't start boiling. Uh, the system seems uh, to prove to be working. Um, I also wanted to make sure that you know that in July 2020, FINSA and FRA published uh, the final rule on this. Uh, they used the data that was collected um, during this test in order to make informed decisions in the rulemaking for this. Okay, and next slide, please. The, uh, now we are moving to um, controls and communication and FRA connected automated vehicle uh, field testing. Uh, this was to uh, basically test the in-vehicle warning system. Um, and um, to, uh, for, for this purposes, Battelle, Honda, and uh, FRA collaborated. Um, I should also uh, indicate that um, Federal Highway um, Administration is also very interested and is a, uh, has collaborated on this project with us. Uh, and continues to do so. Um, this basically provides the project, the test provided uh, um, and confirmed um, successful when um, the vehicle is approaching uh, uh, an active crossing and uh, a collision a, a collision is uh, uh, bound to happen. And basically, the the um, uh, driver of the vehicle is uh, not paying attention. The warning system will go off. So. Uh, we were hoping to do another demonstration uh, in uh, the Washington, D.C. area in April. Unfortunately, we were not able to do that due to the pandemic, but uh, we are hoping that uh, sometime early next year, uh, calendar year, we'll be able to do another demonstration uh, of, of the program. Um, we're working with our automotive industry um, to provide the data to them and show the success and hopefully uh, be able to um, have it implemented in the future design of vehicles. And next slide, please. At the vehicle to vehicle impact test. This is a program led by um, Jeff Gordon and in the rolling stock division. Uh, the vehicle to vehicle test performance uh, was accomplished at TTC um, during Jan January of 2019. Um, that was actually uh, during government shutdown, but none of the government employees um, were involved. However, again, a shout out to uh, the team, the FRAR DMP team, to be able to set things up so that even when they're not there and they're not present, the work continues and uh, we uh, continue to make um, rail operations safer. Uh, in this um, test, basically, uh, as you can see, it's to demonstrate the effectiveness of a retrofit pushback coupler and a deformable anti-climber in um, preventing um, override and head-on collision. The test was extremely successful. I'm sorry you have the PDF version of this. If I, if, um, uh, I could have sent the video, I, I would have provided it. Um, both of those, the animation and the actual video, showed uh, that uh, the energy was absorbed and there was no override. Um, the impact was at the speed of 19.3 miles per hour. The target was 21, so we were fairly close. And um, uh, the um, full-scale full train-to-train test, including the Occupant Protection Experiment, um, um, is planned um, for the end of, there was another one Plan for the end of this year, the calendar year, but uh, I believe it's going to get pushed a little bit to uh, the beginning of 2021. Um, okay. Can we go to the next slide, please? So we do all the work that we do. Again, this was a small sample of the work that we have done, um, but I um, uh, want to um, say that we we do. Um, we have active 
projects in the, all the different areas that um, I have already discussed, um, a number of them, and there just wouldn't be enough time today for me to cover everything. Um, but after we uh, complete the work, we uh, want to make sure that we have technology transfer. Technology transfer doesn't begin for us at the end when the product is completed, the project is completed. I, I think I mentioned multiple times that we engage with industry and researchers in advance and while we're completing the projects to make sure uh, that uh, the technology is adopted uh, by industry. Um, we, do we do have deliverables and we do publish and I'm very proud to say that we've had an extremely successful trend in the past three years in our publication better than um, R&D has ever had. Uh, in 2020, this is fiscal year 2020, which en ended at the end of September of 2020, uh, we had 73 total publications, 52 technical reports, 19 research result reports, and two other, which could be uh, anything from like a journal publication uh, and, uh, or, or a documented presentation. Uh, after the reports uh, are published, they go on our e-library and they are available um, for everyone to see, and you can see a link there if you would like to push, uh, to subscribe to it uh, to receive notification of those. The next slide, please. Um, this is our contact information, of course, uh, it, you know, um, available, the chiefs are available. I have provided information about the uh, program managers for each of those projects that I discussed earlier today. And uh, so uh, that you can directly communicate with them if you have further questions on the uh, technical work itself, on the future um, uh, future of the work and where it's headed. Um, but I also wanted to make an announcement um, um, because I think this is a very good place to make sure that I make this announcement. Um, we have two, we currently have two open positions, uh, program manager level. Uh, one is in the track division, and uh, it will close on um, uh, November 13th. And uh, we have another position that is open in the human factors division, and that will close in, on November 20th. Both of those can be found on USA Jobs. So if you are interested, please uh, look up FRA, USA Jobs, uh, FRA, and see if uh, you would be interested in either one of those positions. With that, I want to thank everyone for their time, and I, I really appreciate being invited to this and being able to share some of the exciting work that we're doing. I'm always excited about it, and um, every day I learn so much from uh, my program managers. So um, thank you. Well, thank you, Miriam. Tremendous. Uh presentation, obviously lots of stuff that's very interesting to us as well as um, all of the people tuning in from really all over the country. Um, do you have some time for some questions? Absolutely, I have the time. And if I can't answer it, I will defer it to <laughs> obviously the uh, program manager. So they know right. the technical stuff, but I'm happy to answer the questions that I, I okay. think I well, we've 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 got a number of them in the um, question box, so I'm, I'll just ask them. And so the first one is uh, in relationship to your PTC research. Um, in a, uh, do you also examine how it can improve railroad efficiency and productivity in addition to its safety benefits? That's a really good question. Um, that is the portion of the work that in collaboration with industry we see industry take the lead on that part and the reason is because uh the the responsibility of fra rdnt is to ensure the safety of the uh, technology that goes forward um that is the main responsibility uh, for fra but as we collaborate with uh with industry on um, moving forward not just on ptc on any other uh, areas uh, we see that uh, the industry takes on the lead for the uh, efficiency and productivity portion. Okay. Another question. Um, I think this is in relationship to the automated track geometry measurement. Um, does the system measure the radius of the curved uh, rails? That is also a really good question. Um, we are currently <laughs> we are currently in the process of developing 
or constructing, I should say, a, a curve over a TTC to be able to uh, uh, um, a hyper elevation, super elevation, and a curve to be able to include a more precise measurement for that as well. That's a work in progress that will probably take about a year, you know, for the construction of it. That's due to the limited funding that we receive. So sometimes we can't just invest a large amount of funds for construction of a, a section of the tracks. So, but by hopefully by the end of next year, we should be able to have that as well. Okay. The next question is in relationship to your um, grade crossing protection uh, or warning systems uh, involving a simple crossing, such as cross bucks, and basically a you know a, 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 and and um, the particular question is, uh, are you looking at how it would work with an autonomous truck? Another thing that we think is probably coming in the future, an unmanned vehicle on the highway. Uh, we have not looked at that portion of it, but there is no reason why it would not be implemented. This is all futuristic, but it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Like I said, we are looking at make, you know, seeing that the automotive industry adopts this and incorporates this with their, their future designs. The goal really is that once this is implemented, as, as you already know, um, when um, if you look at the current design, the technology is already there. Uh, if uh, if you see some of these newer commercials, or you have a newer vehicle, um, you know, approaching an object and, and not paying attention, the car will come to an automatic stop. So the technology is already there. So the hope is, at some point, the same technology would be applied to this in-vehicle warning system. So that if the, the driver is still not paying attention to the warning system, the auditory warning system that they receive, the car would automatically stop. So uh, incorporating that technology in it. And there is no reason why it would not be incorporated with an unmanned vehicle on the road as well. If, you know, we look at it uh, that far into the future. Right, we don't know how far into the future that is, but. <laughs> it might be very soon, who knows? <laughs> So uh, you're getting questions all over your presentation, so and they keep they're actually continuing to roll in here. But uh, in regards to the crash energy management research uh, related to the locomotives, uh, the questioner um, says that all of the tests that at least have been presented, um, the couplers are aligned, um, um, and, and they are they're not self-centering. Uh, but what about offset coupler collisions? Uh, these can occur. Uh, so what about that sort of situation? That's a question that I would strongly uh, advise that the person that has asked the question, uh, definitely communicating with Jeff Gordon because he has all the details on that and he has plans for the future ones, which he could definitely share. So Jeff Gordon would be the um, program manager for that one. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, this one comes from another direction. To what extent do you engage with the uh, rail unions in your research? Engaging is very important because uh, they are our stakeholders. We have many stakeholders. Industry is, universities are, Office of Safety is, and labor union is also one of our stakeholders. Um, and when we have our um, stakeholder reviews, they're always part of it as well. I know that with uh, working groups, they're part of the working groups. I know that with, uh, and I'll use an um, example with the human factors group because I'm most familiar with that too. Uh, um, we had, um, they were developing their strategic plan for um, the use of our simulator uh, at Volpe and um, you know, industry was involved, labor union was involved. So um, we we're quite engaged with the labor union as well. I know from my own experience, you also have representatives of organized labor participating in the um, TRB oversight committee, so. That's correct. Right. Um, so there's another question. Um, what's the pro process that you use to determine uh, research priorities and particular projects get selected? 
Oh, that's a really good question. I get that, asked that question almost daily. So I have a really good answer. <laughs> I'm prepared. Um, it's a complicated process. We have more ideas, good ideas and projects that we get funding for. So prioritization is critical. And sometimes what we have to do is we have the great idea that we don't want to toss, but we have to push it to next year's funding. Sometimes that even happens too. But how do we do that? There are multiple things that go into it. We look at uh, um, industry's uh, needs and we engage with industry needs. We look at our Office of Safety's needs. Uh, those are the, basically our customers. These are the customers that we have. We are in communication with them. We're in working groups um, with the different AAR working groups. We are always engaged. We see what those needs are. What is the driving factor? What are some of the newest technologies that are coming out or, or being discussed? Because we want to be ahead of the game. Uh, we take all of that into account. Um, we look at the strategic goals of the department itself. Um, we pull that information in, but these are all like subjective that we're looking at. Then we have a system called Decision Lens, and the Decision Lens is basically a prioritization tool. We feed a lot of information into the system that we have put in place, and there are uh, uh, questions with different weights that uh, are um, 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 put into this tool. And the questions are based on the goals of FRA, the goals of DOT, uh, the needs of industry. So all of those taken into account. And, and then, um, and then um, the projects that we have go, you know, are put into the system and, and uh, rated. And there is a uh, numeric number that is assigned to it. The numeric number is not the driving factor. It will not, you know, because we are also looking at uh, how long it will take to complete uh, this technology. What is the cost that is associated? So everything goes into into this. But it's, you know, something could get a very high score, but is not necessarily the uh, most important thing for us to immediately pursue. Because, for example, let's say if you if there has been a derailment that is pushing the research into another direction. So we have to pursue that as well. So there are lots of different factors that come in and um, we evaluate, we rank, we use numerical ranking, we use subjective assessment and we work with uh, industry and uh, office of safety to come up with the short list, really the short list because we have a much longer list. The answer is obviously a larger budget for FRA's RD and T program. That would be <laughs> wonderful, yes. And I can say, I can add to that a little bit from my own uh, experience on the oversight committee. This is a very complicated process that FRA has to contend with, with lots of different pressures in different directions. So, you know, it's a, I can speak personally from having, you know, observed your, you and your staff discussion of it. It's, it's non-trivial to be able to work through all this. Um, the next question is, um, could you please elaborate a bit on the training support you provide to shortline railroads? The training support, uh, it's, um, so this came about, and um, I don't, I didn't send the name um, there, but uh, Star Kidda is actually the chief of human factors, and she's also the person that's responsible for this program. This came about um, several years ago, it was after um, Lac Megantic actually accident, and uh, you know the question was raised to then uh, the um, administrator of FRA, how, what are you going to do to make sure this doesn't happen um, on a short line? And and then uh, the uh, ASLRA basically uh, moved forward on you know what can we do uh, to provide uh, services for short lines who don't have the budgets, who, can, who cannot afford to move forward on safety culture programs, basically. And that's, that's how it all began. And initially it started with a you know, small amount of uh, funding that FRA put you know, towards it. Uh, I think it was somewhere between 200 and half a million maybe. Um, that they, it was basically the seed money for it, and we started the institute. And then uh, soon after, uh, Congress actually set aside funding, increased, I should say, increased FRA budget um, by a certain amount and to just put some money towards this uh, institute. 
And um, now we manage this grant that basically uh, the um, uh, that Congress uh, um, provides to the Short Line Safety Institute. We manage it. Um, we do provide a uh, supplement um, uh, evaluation of it. Um, we're a small amount that we do now, but the rest of it is coming from Congress that uh, is basically given as a grant. And Short Line Institute provides the assessment and evaluation of the short lines and provides them with feedback on how they can improve their safety culture. All right. Um, so we have about a half a dozen more questions. Is that going to be all right? Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, this one's back to your uh, ATGMS technology, and I apologize. My keep getting emails. I love it. That okay. <laughs> <laughs> Inevitably, when I get online, they start pouring in. But anyhow, uh, um, have you compared the accuracy of the AGTMS or ATGMS to traditional uh, track geometry measurements? There has been some assessments of that. I don't have all the details for it. So for further details on that, I would say Jay Baylargian could provide you with ample information. And I, I'll just point out, uh, my students and I actually reviewed one of the reports on the development of that technology. It covers something like 10 or 11 years of experience um, starting in the mid 2000s. So. Uh, and I'm, that report, I'm sure, is available on the FRA website. I would certainly yeah. direct people. Um, there's a lot of good information there. Thank you. Um, let me. Something just changed here, so I have to. Okay. Um, has any work been done on the development of real-time mapping applications for tablets or smart devices? Uh, the NTSB mentioned the lack of this technology in its report on the uh, Lakewood derailment uh, a few years ago. Uh, the real-time mapping? Real-time mapping applications for tablets or smart devices? I'm, I'm not, I'm just reading the question. I, I don't know exactly what the questioner is referring to. The mapping of grade crossing? Well, I'm going to ask this questioner to elaborate on this question. We'll move on to the next. <laughs> I can comment on this since I have some news on it. I can just, you know, comment on it a little bit because um, if it is related to what I'm, I'm thinking, um, um, ways um, just recently added uh, um, FRA data, and this was something that NTSB had been pushing, and we had been working on for several years. Uh, but unfortunately, like Google Maps and, and you know other um, apps would not accept it because of the liability. Uh, we worked uh, diligently on making sure that our data is accurate in identifying grade crossings, and uh, Waze has recently adopted that and and has incorporated that to their system in in some areas. So it's gaining traction. I'm hoping that's relevant to what the question is. Okay. Um, next question is related to calculations of braking distance. Um, it, it says, the, the questioner says that it looks like the braking theories are not fully understood by the industry. Well, which braking system? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think they're just, again, the question is, how can you calculate bracing, braking distance theoretically? I mean, I, I have a little familiarity with this. It's obviously a very empirical process combined with uh, developing models to validate uh, or empirically driven process to validate uh, these models. Uh, but it's a, again, anybody who's been involved with, you know, braking curve calculation and breaking algorithms knows it's a very complex process. And uh, it's been a big, and, I know, it's a big process in the PTC. Uh, right. And it, you know, you all obviously have to take into account uh, which system, weight, you know, the number of uh, uh, brake valves. So, it's, so Real uh, unfortunately, I don't have a concrete response to that. 
So the next question is, are there any active projects that involve, uh, uh, that you're working with that involve other federal agencies, uh, such as DOE, uh, DOD, NOAA, USGS? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, I think the questioner wants to know if you're collaborating with any other government agencies on any projects, such as DOE, DOD, NOAA, USGS. Yes, actually, uh, Department of Energy, um, we do. Um, uh, so th we try. It's it's really our goal to find any areas of collaboration. Obviously, within DOT, we have uh, quite a few areas of collaboration with the different nodes, and um, outside of that, especially with uh, uh, you know on um, uh, alternative fuels and that sort of thing, we do uh, work with uh, DOE to the extent that we can. Yeah. Um, we have a questioner who would like to know where to find the contact information for you and your staff. Is is that on the FRA website? Uh, there should be. I have uh, provided a um, um, few emails to um, Emma, of course, for at least the projects that I presented today. And I'll make sure that we can provide more information. Um, you could definitely go to fradot.gov and and uh, find uh, more information. And if you need to speak to anyone in, in my team, uh, feel free to contact me. And I'll definitely put you in touch with whoever you need to speak with. Well, and a related question is, um, are the slides from this presentation gonna be available to everyone? Absolutely, if you choose to put them, um, okay. make them available, that's perfectly fine, absolutely. Well, one approach might be that we could add the contact information for certain key people to this and. Absolutely. Yes. Great. Idea. I mean, these, these questions are coming from all over the country, so not just the University of Illinois. How exciting. <laughs> um, two people have asked, um, what's your annual budget this year and next? We get approximately $40 million a year um, from government. That's the annual budget. Um, that's um, you know, and and you say for next year, we anticipate to get the same thing next year, but we don't know. <laughs> you know, uh, so it's always up in the air, um, clearly. But we anticipate a, a fairly steady, more or less forty million. Um, I've been told, you know, in twenty twenty two might be a little bit less than that, um, but you know, it it, it really all depends. Uh, it's been fairly steady between. 37 and 40.6 now for some time, for at least four or five years. Okay. Um, and may I add something else to, to the yeah. annual budget? Because this, uh, this actually came up uh, a, a, a while, a few days ago. Um, for the number of projects that we do, this is, you know, I have to say it, it's a healthy budget, but it's a small budget. And uh, if you take a look at, for example, FHWA, uh, they, they, you know, the research that they do on fructal tuning is about $40 million. So <laughs> you can imagine, we really try to do the best that we can with the budget. Sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say this much more, maybe vociferously than you might feel comfortable saying, but there's no question that from the modal perspective, the railroads, uh, rail, rail research, federal support for rail research is, far less and should be you know, substantially increased. Um, but we do good work. Yes, yep. Um, all right, uh, just a couple more questions. Um, so this one I think is back to the GPS technology. Pilots and drivers have uh, information, uh, location information using GPS technology. Uh, this questioner is not familiar with Waze, W-A-Y-S, and I only recently heard about this myself. Um, but I believe that's the correct acronym. Uh, locomotive engineers would be able to observe the location of their train in real time if they had access to this. There, this is the questioner's perspective. That's uh, that's really for the dispatcher who has access to that and provides the information. Well, the the, the question the question here seems to be with respect to a locomotive. Oh, it's Waze, W A Z E, right? A Z uh, W A Z E, correct. Right. 
And I think this is a locomotive engineer or somebody's interested in the locomotive engineer's ability to know where their train is in space. So there are moving maps, of course, that provide some information um, to the engineer um, in real time. So and you know, helping them with navigating through the terrains, but uh, um, not necessarily the way we use our GPS. Right. I think we'll just have one more question because uh, I wanna, don't want to take up too much more of your time. Um, I'm enjoying it. So um, what are your, do you have any other plans as far as um, integration of ATGMS with other track inspection systems? We always do. We always have lots of plans there. And uh, I, that's one of the areas that uh, Sean Woody, who's our uh, new track uh, uh, division chief, is, is leading right now. So I don't want to speak on his behalf. And I would really um, would like for him to take the lead on that and, and see where he wants to take it. Next level. All right. Well, like I said, I, I think um, we've been through probably 15 or 20 questions here. and I. Uh, you know, don't want to impose any more, but I uh, really appreciate you giving an outstanding seminar. Again, all of our students and faculty here on campus and literally hundreds of people around the nation, as well as at other universities and at the railroads and various agencies are all tuned in and uh, obviously very appreciative of what you've had to say today. So uh, thank you very much, Miriam. It's good to see you again, too. Absolutely. And thank you. I really appreciate it. I am humbled by the level of interest. I really am. And uh, I really, really enjoyed it. As you know, we don't get out that often. So this is for me a way to get out. <laughs> so thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. And again, several people are asking about how we contact you. I think we'll do what we just talked about a moment ago. We'll, we'll put the key people's contact information on this um, on the PDF for this presentation. We'll post that on our website. And uh, and again, I'll just say from personal experience, uh, it's not hard to find this information on the FRA website as well. So anybody who's wanting it can can search that way as well. So thank you again. Great. Have a wonderful afternoon and a great weekend. Um, uh, at least you. here, it's going to be beautiful. It's seven. It's in the 70s and sunny here in central Illinois. So. Hopefully Same it's here. that nice. <laughs> All right. Same here. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.